Welcome everyone, we'll get started in just a minute. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I am Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. We're very pleased you're here with us today. Um, today's webinar is co-sponsored by Octo, uh, the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas and the NOAA National MPA Center. Um, and we're very excited to welcome our speakers here today. We have Emin Melian, Marine OECM Lead of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas, Tundi Agardi, Director of Sound Seas, and Yannicka Haldeen, Deputy Executive Secretary of Baltic Marine Environmental Protection Commission, the Helsinki and the Helsinki Commission, Helcom. Um, before we get started today, I wanted to let you know a few things about the format of the webinar. Today's webinar is actually going to be 90 minutes so that we have ample time for questions. Um, as someone recently joked, there's been so much confusion about OECMs that there are no, um, that there are otherwise known as other extremely confusing measures. So um, just when we get to the Q&A, we wanted to let you know that there are no silly questions in this webinar. This is your chance to get all your questions answered about OECMs. Um, in terms of asking questions, there's two ways you can ask. You can send the questions into the question panel of the user interface, um, and those will just go to the panelists and myself. Um, or you could type them into the chat um, panel, and you can make it, it's optional whether it's directed to the panelists and, and me or um, everyone in the audience. So, and you're also encouraged to share knowledge that you have that's relevant to uh, OECMs and what is under, is being discussed with everyone in the audience. Uh, we really appreciate all the, the, the resources people have posted in the chat in previous webinars, and it's a tremendous resource to get thoughts and opinions. We just ask that you use that power uh, wisely and keep that uh, any um, information you put into chat to everyone on the topic. Um, we will... Uh, and then we'll have about 45 minutes, uh, maybe a little bit more in presentation and the remaining times will be used for questions. So feel free to send in your questions at any point during the webinar. Uh, we welcome them and we should have plenty of time at the end to address them. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'll turn it over to Iman now. Thanks, Sarah, and welcome everyone. Uh, many of familiar names, actually, and, and people that have been uh, quite involved in the OECM work in the marine environment as I'm scrolling through the attendees list. So it's good to see you all um, joining. As Sarah has said, um, this we really want to uh, answer as many questions as possible, perhaps dispel some myths around OECMs. Um, but first of all, I want to take you um, to the basics, um, knowing that um, quite a few people perhaps are not that familiar um, and haven't been working so much um, in depth uh, on the OECM. So my presentations will focus on a little bit on the background, um, some of the definitions and going into the criteria of OECMs, and it will be followed with a deeper dive on, on fisheries related marine OECMs and then a work in the um, regional seas conventions. A lot of the work has been done over the past I would say, nine to 12 months um, uh, by uh, several people, 
both in the fisheries with RFMOs, but also within regional seas conventions. We have the HELCOM example, the Barcelona Convention, the SPA and the uh, and Cartagena Convention. So there's a lot of movement since the adoption of the definition. Um, and now I just need to be able to move the slides. So just as a reminder that the very first time the wording other effective area-based conservation measures was, was used um, was at the IGI Target 11 and the adoption of the CBD um, uh, plan. Um, and that is in relation to the protected areas target that really was to recognize that other areas, other area-based conservation measures equally contribute to the target and to the conservation of biodiversity. And the intent was to see, to capture them. They may not be recognized um, officially as protected areas, but they have the same outcomes. Um, and since the adoption of that wording, there has been a lot of work, but by IUCN, uh, World Commission on Protected Areas, uh, a, a task force was formed. I don't want to go into all the detail, but we contributed a lot to uh, the definition and to the uh, CBD decision that um, uh, had defined the criteria. So uh, a snapshot, it, it took the CBD eight years to agree on a definition and a criteria, and that is uh, the details are captured in decision 14 slash um, eight. It adopted the definition. It welcomed the set of guidance that is the annex three to the, de the decision, um, including the criteria, and they are to be applied in a flexible way and on a case-by-case -case basis. And we'll see that when we go through the cl criteria, there's really, not, it's not very easy to define everything to the details. And so um, as we go, it, it, the criteria are supposed to apply to any ecosystem, marine, terrestrial, freshwater, mountain, you name it. Um, and so uh, they are basic principles, but there is a lot of flexibility in their implementation. And the decision also encouraged the parties to start identifying their OECMs and to submit data um, on OECMs to the UNEP WCMC. IUCN and WCMC have been invited to expand the database um, on protected areas uh, to provide a section on OECM so that we can capture them separately from protected areas and see where the differences lie. Um, and IUCN, FAO, another expert body have been invited to assist the parties in identifying um, OECM. So some of the work that we're doing today goes into um, supporting that. So looking at the details of the CBD definition, which really has the four main criteria of what constitutes an OECM. It is a geographically defined area other than a protected area. So it cannot be a protected area, otherwise we, we, we double count, um, which is governed and managed. It has to have a management system of sorts in a way that achieves positive and sustained long-term outcomes for the in-situ conservation of biodiversity with associated ecosystem functions and services and other locally relevant values. Um, but it's it, the area needs to be managed and it has to have positive outcomes for biodiversity. That sounds simple. And, and so a lot of the questions that we get sometimes is, then what's the difference between an OECM and a protected area? In protected area, the focus is on the, on the primary objective that it has to be a conservation objective. An OECM needs to show effective conservation outcomes regardless of their objectives. And these are for many areas, they don't necessarily have biodiversity as part of their objective. They could have cultural objectives or um, um, sustainable production objectives, but nevertheless, they do produce um, uh, positive biodiversity outcomes. And one of the other questions that often came in, in several marine workshops, oh, then EPSAs are OECMs. Well, no. Because the definition said that the area had to be governed and managed. And some of the EPSAs are, and, and these could be OECMs, and, and they should be assessed as such. 
but many are only identified because of their biological and ecological attributes. And so unless they have a management measure and a management regime, they are not OECMs. So um, that is one of the questions that we can answer off directly. Um, OECMs can have a range of governance type. Uh, there is, you know, various examples. They could be government-run, uh, government-managed. Uh, they could be private areas. Uh, they could be managed by indigenous people in local communities, or they could have a shared management or, or governance um, regime. So here we can we can have a lot of options. I think as we look into how the OECM achieves in situ. Uh, conservation and bi uh, of biodiversity, there is less, you know, there is a gradient between whether the area have more intention to conserve biodiversity or less intention to conserve biodiversity, but that doesn't necessarily impact on the conservation outcomes, but, but we would like to give ideas um, of, of um, a variety of options. So the less intention, we're talking about ancillary areas, these are no disturbance areas um, or sacred natural sites, potentially military areas or war grave because of their other values will be closed and therefore would produce biodiversity outcomes because they have no disturbance. Um, some of the conservation uh, objectives could be secondary, and these are areas that are protected uh, through very low impact use, so perhaps watershed protection areas or ecosystem service related wetlands where we're going to be protecting for production of a service but not necessarily for biodiversity. It's implied in there, or it could be secondary, but it's not the primary one. Um, however, some protect, some OECMs can have a primary uh, conservation objectives, and these could be um, uh, indigenous or community conserved areas or private areas with a primary conservation objectives, but either they are unable to secure a protected area designation because of the legislation, or they simply prefer not to be recognized as a protected areas and they may choose or not um, to go through the OECM route. And then we'll see that the, the, um, the choice and, and the prior informed consent of the governance authority is, is a, an important criterion. Some of the characteristics of OECMs is, the first is that they should have significant biodiversity values. These are areas that contribute to target 11 or to area-based conservation target and therefore to the conservation of biodiversity. And, and if you see the target, we are talking about areas of importance for biodiversity or ecosystem services. So they have to have significant biodiversity value. And that could be the first one of the, when, when we go through the assessment, it's, it's a very useful question to ask. The second is that they can also have a an important role in conservation of ecosystem functions and services. And this is, again, many of them will have that as primary objective. The recognition of OECM provides an opportunity to support in situ conservation of biodiversity over the long term. Um, and one of the questions that really keep repeating itself, particularly from the protected area community, is because we're so geared to think protected areas and planning of protected areas and so on, that we try to put a parallel to everything. Is it, The question is, are OECM comparable, equivalent, or complementary to protected areas? Well, they are both. They, but the most important thing is that they're comparable and complementary to effective protected area, because some of the question is, well, some of protected areas don't do this and some of protected areas don't do that. They're supposed to, but they don't. And when we go through the criteria, the definition, the word effective is really important and the criteria are meant to distinguish what's effective and what's not effective by focusing on the outcome. And so it's not so much in protected area focus on the processes, but the complementarity and comparability is to effective protected areas. And they contribute to the coherence and connectivity of the protected areas network. So that is also important. 
I won't go through this in, in details, but there are various benefits of OECMs, definitely conservation of importance, ecosystem services, habitat, species, supporting uh, the recovery of threatened species or, or ecosystem, maintaining ecosystem functions, enhancing resilience, retaining and connected uh, fragmented ecosystems, um, and certainly contributing to an ecologically representative and well-connected conservation network. So the CVD has defined, and we'll go through it through some details, um, some criteria for identifying OECMs. And the one thing I really want to um, focus on a little bit is spelling out what constitutes effectively managed. So the intention was to avoid paper parks and, and, and that do that, but not necessarily um, uh, to go through an ev management evaluation, as we've seen in the previous, um, the, on the Tuesday webinar, that you don't necessarily need to do that. The focus is, is on the results and the outcome and not on the processes. Um, and we, because they couldn't cover every possibility, so they need to be applied on a case-by-case -case basis and with some flexibility. So the first criterion is that the area is not currently recognized as a protected area. They may meet a protected area definition, but they are not recognized and accounted for as such. And, and that is important. So um, in, in a, a site with a primary conservation objective, could be recognized as protected area or OECM, and that very much depends on the governance authority. The criterion B is that the area is governed and managed, um, uh, and, and that has three components to it, that we are talking about a geographically defined space in the marine environment in three dimensions where necessary. And that again will depend on what the biodiversity outcome is and whether that's necessary or not, and whether that enables that. Um, that the governance, uh, that the area has a legitimate governance authority um, and that is appropriate for achieving the conservation of biodiversity within the area. It reflects equity considerations and it could be a single authority or shared management. That the area is managed in ways that achieve positive and sustained outcomes for conservation of biological diversity. It has a management system in place, not necessarily a management plan. ICCIs do not need a management plan, but the system is in place and the area is managed. And, and again, it's to um, it, it, the management enables adaptability. Criterion C is about digging into the details of what do we mean by achieve sustained and effective contribution to in-situ biodiversity conservation? So the area achieves or is expected to achieve positive and sustained outcomes. That means that the threats existing or reasonably anticipated are addressed effectively and that the there are mechanisms in place to recognize and respond to new threats where needed, um, that the management is sustained over the long term um, in, or likely to be, and this, for example, is going to come with temporary measures, whether we expect them to be sustained in the long term or not. Um, and in situ conservation, it, it, it really needs to have a, identified a range of biodiversity attributes that are important um, and that it has um, some monitoring system uh, of sort that feeds back into the management. The last criterion is really where relevant um, that the area contributes to ecosystem functions and services and that these are supported. Most importantly, that the management to enhance one ecosystem function does not impact negatively on the site's overall biological diversity and um, it, contributes, it contributes to the conservation of um, cultural and other Econ uh, economic or other relevant uh, values that are locally relevant to the site. And again, these are where relevant, not necessarily needed, but where the area has them, um, it, should, it, it should contribute to that. I don't want to go into so much details on the reporting of the OECMs, but um, there is a system and I would um, uh, invite you to follow the link. Uh, the WDPA manual has a lot of the details of what is needed for the reporting with all the Excel sheets and the, what needs to do the, in the, uh, to go into the database. 
Um, the reporting really enables us to see where we're advancing uh, uh, on the target, uh, but also supports the integration of OECMs into landscape and seascape management, and it enables improved coordination with protected areas once these areas are reported. I'm skipping all of that details, but here are some suggested steps for the identification and reporting of OECMs. And, and several of the guides, the WCPA guides, um, FAO and others are also working on, on guides that are specific, for example, FAO for fisheries and others may be in, in their own sectors. Um, several are moving towards um, having a quick assessment tool with a few key questions that are eliminatory, and that enables you to identify a potential OECM. Once that potential area is identified, then you go into a more in-depth analysis of the candidate OECM, and again, seeing how the criteria would be applied. And there you go into two options, if you will. Either the area meets the criteria and then you report it to the WC, uh, uh, WCMC, or it doesn't, but it could be strengthened. And then you may go, go through a process where um, some of the management measures could be strengthened or monitoring or whatever was not optimal. Um, and then go back through the assessment um, and, and reporting. So really, OECM represents an opportunity to recognize areas and, and stakeholders' efforts that contribute to in situ conservation. So a lot of dialogue has been happening between the conservation communities and various sectors, fisheries, forestry, and others in the terrestrial environment, but also beyond fisheries, oil and gas productions, um, uh, marine spatial planning, various other uh, marine efforts as well. Um, they provide an opportunity definitely to contribute not only to the biodiversity goals, but to the SDGs, because many of them have a primary objective that's different from conservation. Um, there will be an essential element in the post-2020 in the wording currently being negotiated in Nairobi. They're still there, so we expect them to be continuing. Um, and the process of identification of OECM has really so far been a fantastic dialogue because between the conservation and other sector. And it has as a minimum, an opportunity to enhance mainstreaming of biodiversity. I think in the marine environment, the regional processes are useful. That's what we've seen. Uh, we've seen it in various places. Uh, it enables catalyzing the identification of OECM by countries, but also help sharing experiences and feedback from countries on their processes and the challenges they face. Uh, it also enables agreeing on thresholds uh, within a regional sea. It's really important to have some coherence um, and um, it promotes cross-sectorial dialogue as well. So in, in, in all of the action that's been happening over the past year and a half or so, the, the question that raised a lot is we're really having a debate on how we can improve the management, the effectiveness of MPAs, because the burden of proof currently is quite high for OECM, not so much high for marine protected areas, and that it should be the same for both. So here are a few resources that could be helpful um, uh, from WCPA. You can log into these and I'll stop here and hand it over. Thank you. Thank you, Iman. Um, we have already a number of questions and actually the chat's wonderful in terms of, of asking and answering questions, but let's go on with all the presentations and we'll tackle the questions at the end. So I guess, um, Sarah, I will take over. Hello, okay. everyone. I am Tundi Agardi. <clears throat> Please let me know if you can um, see my screen. We are not seeing your screen. Oh, yep, no, now it's up. Okay, good. Well, um, thank you to all the participants who are here from all around the world. It's wonderful to see so many people who are already engaged in OECMs and people who are engaged in other aspects of marine conservation um, who are willing and, and interested in learning more about this. Um, Iman has done a fantastic job of um, presenting OECMs in the marine context. And I'm going to talk specifically about um, OECMs in marine fisheries, so only in one sector. 
but what admittedly one very important sector. Uh oh, there we go. <laughs> so as Iman already mentioned, OECMs create huge opportunities. Um, for one, the uh, identification of existing measures that um, meet OECM criteria allow for the recognition of the contributions that other um, kind of unconventional management agencies and user communities make to biodiversity conservation. The unconventional, I mean, in that by um, agencies that aren't necessarily involved with protected area establishment. So that recognition is hugely important. Um, it's important that the marine conservation community learn from what these non-conventional actors are doing. Um, but it's also important to recognize the hard work of these agencies and communities um, that are doing the right thing. Um, OECMs also incentivize the uptake and the replication of successes, um, the successful application of these measures um, in areas where biodiversity outcomes are demonstrated. Um, they, the recognition of OECMs um, and, the, and the reporting of OECMs also creates a data set from which we can learn how to best design um, and implement new OECMs. So learning from past experience and being able to replicate that as appropriate to a region or to a country um, is critically important. Um, as Iman mentioned already, uh, it's not just the in situ uh, contribution to biodiversity conservation that is important that these specific areas um, allow, but also their contribution to wider networks of MPAs and OECMs working together um, to achieve really large scale conservation across many interconnected ecosystems. So. We know that we right now with MPA networks, you know, we have a lot of gaps. Um, these networks are rarely interconnected. And um, we also have a lot of gaps in terms of not just the ecosystem covered and represented, uh, but also the connectivity, the ecological connectivity. So being able to plug some of those holes with OECMs um, will be critically important on a large scale. And then lastly, um, fisheries OECMs in particular, hugely important in being able to generate information, not only on the state of biodiversity in a place, uh, but also the health of the environment. And that's because uh, fisheries management agencies and communities of fishers are collecting a lot of information. Many of that, those kinds of data um, do not actually find their way typically into marine conservation planning initiatives. So this is a way to kind of bridge those worlds and, um, and get larger uh, knowledge transfer going. Um, in some sense, the openness of this CBD definition, which is, I originally I termed this vague, but I didn't want to make it sound like I was judgmental. Um, it's a rather open-ended kind of definition, um, but that open-ended definition creates some opportunities um, because uh, the CBD not only um, describes OECMs in this generic sense, um, not tying to any specific um, ecosystem or biome, um, but also very explicitly states that um, OECMs need to be uh, identified on a case-by-case -case basis and that um, those reporting OECMs need to be flexible. So as Ivan mentioned, the CBD uh, not only adopted the definition of the OECM, but they also welcomed the guidance. And I should mention that uh, with respect to fisheries OECM, um, under the um, leadership of Deputy Director Vera Agostini, Amber Hines Cornell um, is taking the lead on developing um, several sets of guidance on fisheries OECM uh, to, uh, to guide the identification of uh, what can constitute um, fisheries OECM uh, and also the design of future fisheries OECM. So um, that is a very big emphasis of FAO right now. And, um, there's been a lot of um, kind of 
field testing uh, some of the concepts and um, trying to understand what are the regional um, uh, limitations and also challenges um, in applying fisheries OECM. Um, and there have been re regional workshops in, in several of the world's regions, I, as Amen already mentioned. Um, just to reiterate, we need to ensure that um, countries are not double counting. So it's got, going to be critically important to not only um, give guidance on how to identify existing measures that are contributing to biodiversity conservation, um, to identify those um, that are doing so and are not already labeled and reported as MPAs. Um, uh, but at the same time to validate um, that actually the biodiversity outcomes that we're seeing in these um, potential OECMs um, are attributable to the measures that are taken and, and that those measures are going to be lasting so that the um, biodiversity outcome um, is long-term. So the huge opportunities in the fisheries sector, um, there are some basic questions that apply to o all OECMs, um, but this is the way that uh, we're thinking about it on the fisheries side. So uh, to qualify as an OECM, um, the fisheries management measure must be used in a bounded area. It has to be uh, mappable <laughs> and it has to be fixed in space. So uh, for the time being, uh, I don't, I don't think the idea of uh, dynamic ocean management and fisheries management with moving um, restricted areas um, can quite handle uh, the OECM label. Uh, maybe at a future time we'll be sophisticated enough for that. But for now, fixed boundaries, um, of course, can't be an MPA, although the OECM um, can um, contain MPAs. Uh, it, another basic question is about effective management. And as Iman said, it's not necessary to do a management assessment to be able to understand uh, whether this, this uh, particular area and the management measure will qualify as an OECM. Uh, but it is already implicit there because it is absolutely imperative that a biodiversity outcome be shown. And in order for a biodiversity outcome to be shown, uh, we assume that management must be effective. Um, a really important basic question as people and agencies and communities review the things that they are already doing in fisheries management to know if these can qualify as OECM is, uh, is are there important biodiversity features in the area under consideration? So that may sound ridiculous and nonsensical, but um, to be able to describe these biodiver biodiversity features um, that are really the focus of the OECM um, is critically important because that's also going to be important in terms of being able to provide evidence for the outcome um, that shows that those biodiversity features are being um, preserved or even enhanced. Um, the question of sustained, I already mentioned, but uh, and we'll get back to that in a, in a second with respect to fisheries OACMs. Um, a lot related to this question of is the management sustained so that we expect a long term outcome um, is is there monitoring in place <laughs> to verify that in fact management is in place and that the outcome is actually um, in place or being sustained over time. So without monitoring these OECM, they may well be uh, measures that are taking place in an area where biodiversity outcomes are positive, uh, but without the proof, um, they cannot qualify. So. Uh, monitoring needs to be in place. And this is why um, I mentioned that fisheries OECMs provide a huge opportunity because as you know, fisheries management agencies, um, RFMOs, um, fishing communities, um, NGOs, a lot of different actors are monitoring different aspects of fisheries and the em environment in which fisheries take place. Um, so that data can be very useful um, for providing evidence for OECM. 
Um, and then the last thing I just put in brackets because does the measure contribute to preserving or enhancing ecosystem services? Well, de facto uh, fisheries production area, uh, any fisheries management measure is going to be contributing to um, the provisioning service, <laughs> providing food for people. So uh, we can check that box. Uh, certainly if there's information on ecosystem services that are being supported by the management measures beyond food production, um, it should be described, uh, but it's not necessary uh, as a discriminating um, criterion for determining an a fisheries OECM. Now, behind some of these basic questions lie some more complicated uh, questions also um, that have to do specifically with OECMs in the marine environment. Um, you know, we are in the marine world. Um, challenged by certain aspects of the marine environment. And we all rise to the challenge and we all love do, doing this kind of work. So, um, but it does, it does make our life a little bit complicated. Um, so if we just take the agreed definition or the, the portion of it, that's really uh, the meat of the definition, uh, which is achieve the OECM achieves positive and sustained long-term outcomes for the in situ conservation of biodiversity. One question we might ask is what biodiversity are we specifically referring to? Um, and to answer that in the fisheries um, management context or fisheries OECM context, um, one point is that the, the biodiversity attributes need to be described. So in an area where you have a fisheries management measure, um, and there's some evidence that that fisheries management measure is contributing positively to biodiversity, uh, immediately, the, the, that biodiversity uh, needs to be described. Um, and typically, uh, these um, fisheries management measures that are contributing to biodiversity conservation are in places where biodiversity uh, is notable for some reason. A vulnerable marine ecosystem, uh, a, a particularly productive um, ecosystem that's contributing to wider food web support, um, uh, an area of endemic species or what have you. So there's that one issue of what biodiversity are we talking about for people who, who are identifying and reporting OECMs to be very specific about what's there and what's, what's the notable uh, biodiversity um, attributes that you see there. But the second question is the one that Iman already referred to, which is, um, is a whole of nature approach necessary for OECM? In the 3D environment in which we work, um, it's often the case that a management measure will only target either the benthos or the water column, or even some portion of the water column and not the whole water column. And the question is, for those kinds of fisheries management measures, does that count? Uh, and does it count? Um, so, and I don't, um, I, I don't profess to have the answer, and I don't, uh, I don't think it's appropriate for me to have the answer, or for anyone, for that matter, to have the answer. Rather, this is a question that needs to be um, asked every time an institution or a country or a region is going through the process of identifying and reporting OECMs. So these questions will be decided again on a case by case basis, but whatever the answer is, uh, it needs to be described in the reporting of the OECM. So it can't, what, and if I don't think I'm making myself very clear with this. So what I mean to say is um, uh, an OECM that is, identified and then reported as a fisheries OECM should describe exactly what portion of that 3D space has the notable biodiversity attributes that are um, being protected or enhanced um, and describe it in, the, in, this, in this kind of three-dimensional space. And if it's the entire three-dimensional space, water column and benthos together, that's great, and that, that that's what should be um, described. Uh, but again, back to my previous point about monitoring, it's critically important that the monitoring data um, be there to show that the management measure is actually um, addressing those various facets of the 3D space. 
Related to this question, and I don't want to spend any time on this, but it, this is kind of a side issue is that, you know, uh, Iman mentioned the progress towards the targets and the fact that OECM are being counted alongside uh, MPAs in meeting uh, the old Aichi targets and whatever comes out in the biodiversity framework strategy. Um, so what we have actually in WDPA is two-dimensional reporting, right? We have maps that show lines on maps where there are MPAs and where there are OECMs. And it's WDPA is doing its best to show that some of those areas are benthic and some of those areas are water column. Um, rarely are those um, all, all three dimensions of an area. Uh, but it does ask, it does kind of beg the question, and this is maybe something for another seminar, is uh, when we talk about a 30% target, are we talking about 30% volume or 30% uh, of the two-dimensional uh, mapping space? Anyway, not for today. Um, going back to that uh, definition and achieve positive and sustained long-term outcomes for the in-situ conservation of bio bio biodiversity. Another uh, question is what constitutes the sustained part of this? What is sustained and what is long-term? Well, I think we all assume that the sustained refers to the management. So management should be sustained. That does not mean continual, uh, that can mean periodic, but it must mean sustained over time. Um, and that the outcome is what's long-term. So the outcome has to be, um, in perpetuity, essentially. So what we have in fisheries management is we have a lot of measures, whether they're um, restricted fishing areas, uh, they can be um, temporary closures. Um, we have a lot of different kinds of fisheries management tools that are place-based. Um, many of these tools are renewed periodically and are not permanent. Uh, and the question is, when can they qualify as, a, as an OECM and meet that kind of sustained and long-term outcome um, bit of the definition? So um, that answer to that question, and again, I, I don't pretend to have any answers. <laughs> I only have the questions, but uh, one way to address the uh, question would be to try and determine the extent to which uh, a renewed man fisheries management measure um, is likely to be um, renewed over time. So likely not to be um, stopped and likely to, to keep going. And that can be looked at on a case by case basis through each region. Um, and Serge Garcia in a workshop in the Caribbean mentioned that uh, it's very, very rare, for instance, to have fisheries restricted areas be uh, kind of delisted. De so these, even, the, even though the renewal is every five years and these are not permanent measures, um, it is de facto um, a long-term sustained commitment uh, because these renewals keep happening and that's the historical trend. Uh, so there's every reason to believe that they'll be um, sustained into the future. Okay, and then the biggest one, probably uh, the biggest question around this um, definition, achieve positive and sustained long-term outcomes for the in situ conservation of biodiversity. So what do we mean by positive outcome? Um, and, and by that, I mean, we have a situation where will have some F impacts that are positive and will likely to have some things happening that may be negative. Uh, and the question is, is there a way to cal calculate whether there's a net positive? Uh, and if there's a net positive, then the biodiversity outcome, as long as it's sustained long-term, um, can count. So countries and agencies are already, and I should mention that several countries have already established um, fisheries OECM, so they, they have already gone through this process um, and have decided on a way to determine that effect. Um, but as Iman mentioned, uh, it's really important to understand what threats are affecting the biodiversity in a place, in the place that is being considered. Um, not just the current threats, but the imminent threats, the threats that are expected to come, 
Um, and it is conceivable that an easy way to kind of address this net positive question is to develop a list of threats in to the biodiversity attributes of the place, um, including future threats to the extent they're known, um, and create essentially a checklist and understand to the extent to which the management measures are addressing those threats. Um, and just a note, um, there's a lot of threats, of course, to the marine environment that are not locally manageable and that could not possibly be addressed by any, any sectoral management or any integrated management at the site, uh, like climate change. So although climate change is going to be threatening um, you know, a lot of these sites and the biodiversity outcomes, impacting the biodiversity outcomes, the threat of climate change um, is not, it's not reasonable to have that um, exclude um, an area from being an OECM, just like it isn't reasonable to exclude it from um, having an MPA um, claim that it's doing uh, protection of the marine biodiversity. Okay, and then last, well, almost last, um, there is a lot of discussion right now in the OECM and MPA world, both about um, industrial activities that cause adverse impacts. And we are very lucky on the fisheries side that there is a good definition of significant adverse impacts in fisheries. So we do know kind of the limits of what, you know, what we would label as um, adverse impact and what we would look to exclude from any OECM um, or another way to put that is if it's present in an, in an area that's being considered as an OECM, it's not likely that that will be, uh, will qualify as an OECM. I know the conservation community is debating a lot of, um, in a lot of different fora about um, what this list of adverse impacts um, should be. Uh, what industry should be on it, how, what are the thresholds for the adversity. Um, and that's a, another, another uh, webinar maybe, um, but it's certainly very informative for the OECM debate. Um, and it's useful to have those kind of no-go or um, disqualifying adverse impacts in mind when reviewing OECM. Um, Lastly, on this um, fisheries OECM versus other kind of marine OECM, uh, there's a lot of different kind of data um, that can be used to support uh, the candidacy, if you will, of a fisheries OECM. So there's um, a lot of monitoring data, as I mentioned, um, and including data collected by not just fisheries management agencies, um, and academia, but also from users themselves. Um, and particularly in these co-management arrangements uh, with responsible fishing areas, for instance, uh, you have a lot of the fishers themselves collecting data, not just on the fish stocks, fishery stocks, but also on the wider um, environmental health. Um, and uh, in addition, of course, there's a lot of peer reviewed studies about um, the state of the environment and the state of the fisheries um, in certain places that can be used, um, as well as expert opinion. And with that, um, it, it's going to be critically important to engage the regional fisheries management organizations and the regional seas organizations um, who, that have frameworks actually for expert opinion um, that can be harnessed. Now, just to end here, I'm going to turn things on its head a little bit uh, and say that um, the global and generic guidance on OECM um, is really important, but it's not going to be able to kind of support all OECM identification. And we need to recognize um, that countries can report whatever actually they want to report as OECM. Uh, so as much as we we are pushing for kind of global standards and um, a shared understanding about what we mean when we say OECM and what we mean by biodiversity outcome. Uh, we also have to understand that many countries have already reported. Um, some 
some countries are um, very systematically going through their areas and um, evaluating them. Some countries are doing this opportunistically. Um, communities are also um, looking at OECMs. Uh, so the, the global kind of generic guidance can only take us so far. And um, this kind of case by case uh, basis uh, is not, not an excuse <laughs> that we use to say we don't have the answer to the question, but rather something that really um, points to how important it is to support uh, local efforts to um, identify and then to report um, OECM. Uh, there's just so many ways that these criteria can be interpreted and data availability is so variable all around the world um, that uh, there has to be a, a big diversity of approaches to this. Um, that said, um, being able to uh, show case studies for how different regions and different places, uh, different areas in the world um, I, identify and report OECM is really useful. Um, and Janneke, who is coming up next, will give a really good um, brief on the situation in Helcom, um, way beyond fisheries OECMs to going to all back to marine OECMs in general. Um, but learning from these regional efforts and from case by case, um, cases as they arise um, is really important. And having IUCN be able to kind of track that and distill the lessons learned is also critically important. Um, Amen mentioned this, but I just wanna say it again, um, this distinction between OECMs and MPAs. I mean, OECMs are held to a much higher standard than MPAs. And uh, because the focus is on the outcome, you really can't think about designating an OECM or reporting an OECM unless you have some evidence of a positive outcome. And that is different from MPA, which is sometimes intentional outcomes, but um, no real requirement for um, actual outcomes. So I know that point's been made, but I think it needs to be, keep being made throughout. Uh, and in a way, it just really is an exciting time to be working on OECMs because as Iman said, it allows us to also um, push on the MPA front a little bit and, and see if we can get MPAs held to that high standard as well. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Janneke. If I can figure out how to stop sharing. <laughs> thank you, Tandy. There you go. I think Janneke can just start at any point. <clears throat> yes, thank you. I will share my screen here. Okay, can somebody confirm that you can see my screen in the right mode? Yes, okay, great, thanks. Uh, okay, hello everyone. My name is Yannick Hallin. Uh, as Sarah mentioned in the beginning, uh, I am Deputy Executive Secretary of HELCOM, which is the Regional Sea Convention for the Baltic Sea. Uh, and in the Baltic Sea, we have kicked off work on OECMs on a regional level. So all the countries jointly together uh, are discussing how we should approach OECMs. And uh, I will take you through how this has gone so far and uh, what um, kind of benefits and, and challenges we have encountered and uh, also where we are heading from here, because of course, this isn't the end of the story. Uh, there is a lot of unanswered questions and, and um, a lot of, uh, like, it's a very dynamic <laughs> process uh, because there aren't any uh, concrete answers available, uh, especially not when you look at the regional level yet. So that's what I will be taking you through here. But I will give you some background because I know that uh, the Baltic Sea is a small sea and not one that maybe uh, reaches the global uh, stage very often. So I'll give you some background on the sea and uh, what Helcom is. So you have some context for in like in what framework have we been working with these questions and uh, and where does this all start from? So overall, the Baltic is a very small sea. Uh, it's young, um, 
much, much younger than most seas around the planet, planet but it's also under extremely heavy anthropogenic pressure. Uh, it used to be famous for being the sea under the most pressure in the world, uh, which maybe isn't what you want to be famous for, but, uh, but that was the case. Uh, but because it is under such high anthropogenic pressure, it, it also has uh, like very long term and very well established governance structures because uh, the countries around the Baltic realized early on that, that this isn't sustainable and there something needs to be done. And so uh, all of these structures are already existing there and have been around for well, almost 50 years now. This has also led to uh, close international cooperation. Uh, both across levels, so from the expert level uh, all the way up to, um, to state level, uh, but also across sectors um, where there are a lot of sectors that are either influenced or are influenced by the work that is being done. And they all uh, want and need to have a seat at the table so that uh, the discussions uh, are actually actionable and implementable. Uh, there is, uh, high political level support, which I know uh, is something that isn't necessarily the case in many parts of the world. Uh, but in the Baltic, we are lucky there is high political support for the work to protect the, the Baltic Sea environment. Uh, there's also long standing monitoring. Uh, monitoring started joint monitoring across the countries where they agreed on what to monitor and how to monitor and how to report it all the way back in the early 70s. So uh, comparatively, we have quite a lot of data to build our decisions on um, and to kind of support uh, all of the, the work that is going on. Uh, and because of all of these things, and the Baltic is actually, for being such a small sea, quite often used as a time machine or a test lab for other oceans and seas uh, that can see that, okay, there, there is increasing anthropogenic pressure or, um, for climate change, for example, we see we're seeing the effects of climate change in the Baltic at a much faster um, in a much faster time frame than than for many of the seas around the world. And that's a little bit what we're going to do here: uh, use the Baltic as a test case to see how did this work, uh, did it work, and uh, can you use it uh, in other regions. And then about Helcom. So when we talk about this international cooperation and uh, and like this political level support, this is tied to the work of Helcom. And Helcom is the regional sea convention for the Baltic Sea. So uh, the convention for protecting the Baltic Sea environment. Uh, and uh, it was signed originally in 1974. Uh, with the Secretariat being established uh, in the early 80s, and the Secretariat is where I work. Uh, and the Secretariat helps the countries um, to implement the convention by pro providing support uh, and also uh, doing a lot of the kind of project work and so on that needs to be done in, uh, jointly across the, the countries around the Baltic. Uh, as of 1992, due to geopolitical changes, there was an update of the convention and uh, all 10 uh, states around the Baltic Sea uh, then signed the, uh, the updated convention. So there are 10 contracting parties, the nine countries and the EU uh, that are all party to the convention, which also means that we have good uh, spatial coverage um, and we, ha we have all the areas of the Baltic Sea covered. So how do we make decisions? Where do we start discussing OECMs uh, in the Baltic? So in Helcom, it usually starts with a mandate or an impulse to look at something specific. In this case, it was OECMs and the, the impulse um, was getting closer to the deadline for the IHG targets and countries starting to look at, okay, have we actually implemented or not? Okay, we have not implemented the OECMs because nobody at the time really knew what OECMs were. Then this goes on to the expert level, uh, usually an expert group or a workshop, a set of workshops and so on, where this is discussed in more detail and, and um, you find the scientific information and data to underpin uh, any decisions. Then it goes to working group. This is the interface between science and policy. Um, and uh, 
here there are national experts, usually representing authorities, for example, that can sit together uh, and discuss like, okay, how uh, does this meet our requirements? Do we see that there are gaps or problems with this? And then how can we overcome these? Then it moves on to the political level where we have uh, ministry representatives that then actually approve all of the work uh, that is going on on the lower levels uh, and also brings this up then to, to the political arena. And then occasionally we also have uh, further higher meetings. Once a year we have a commission meeting uh, and then we also have ministerial meetings about every three years where it's the actual uh, ministers for the environment from the different countries that work together. And uh, in the work on OECMs, we have now come to somewhere between step two and step three in the HELCOM work. So we have started the work on expert level uh, and part of it has already progressed to where it's being discussed at working group level. But why are we getting involved at all? Would it not be easier to just leave this to somebody else? Uh, aren't there enough players in the OECM arena already uh, that, that the RSCs or the regional C conventions maybe don't need to get involved? And this is the first step in the discussion. This is where the impulse comes from. Do the countries actually see benefit from uh, HELCOM or any regional sea convention being involved in the OECM work. Uh, and when we had this discussion in HELCOM, uh, there were many points lifted that supported the regional sea conventions being part uh, of this work. Um, one is ecological relevance, uh, ecological relevance excuse me, uh, where many of the the things that we are trying to protect, whether they are uh, species or habitats, uh, they don't recognize anthropogenic borders and in order for conservation to be effective it needs to be done at an ecologically relevant scale and that ecologically relevant scale often uh, is transboundary uh, and that's where a regional sea convention can come in and and support the work because it's being done or it should be done across more than one country then there is, of course, the possibility to use these existing structures. The regional sea conventions are already there. They already have a lot of experience um, and the countries uh, are kind of familiar with how they work. The regional sea conventions also have a pretty, very broad vertical and horizontal scope. Uh, as in, we're talking expert level all the way up to, um, to the ministers. Uh, but also across a large number of topics. And this is really relevant for OECMs, as we will see a little later in this presentation. Then most uh, regional sea conventions have goals or objectives that are very well aligned uh, with OECMs to start with. So there is a, a good synergistic effect between the work on OECMs and the work that the regional sea conventions are doing anyway. Uh, they're a good platform for identifying shared challenges, solutions, and best practices. This is one of the reasons they, the regional sea conventions exist in the first place. Uh, and especially for the ones that have been around for a little bit longer, there is a good track record uh, for this. And there is a need to take a more strategic approach uh, to conservation. Uh, and here, this transboundary aspect comes in again. If you need to be strategic about what you're, um, what you're protecting, then it's not necessarily the most constructive approach to protect it only within your national borders. And again, here, the regional sea conventions can support the countries. So based on all of this, the countries in the, around the Baltic Sea uh, agreed that HELCOM is a good platform for further discussion on OECMs and that they would like uh, to use this to support their national efforts. So then we decided to kick off. Um, that was the first point. Are countries interested in OECM work at all? So this is essentially establishing the frame or the framework that we will be working on OECMs in. If there is no interest, there is no real kind of drive to do this. And then you can't, you can't force it, uh, especially not on a regional level because uh, there's too many, too many um, parties that are involved in the discussion. Then this question is, 
have the countries wor started working on OECMs nationally? So what is the baseline that we're starting from? Uh, if they have, uh, how far have they gotten? If they haven't, then the next question here is, why haven't they? And this is a form of gap analysis that we did. If they haven't started, why haven't they started? What is the barrier or the challenge that they need to overcome in order to actually start looking at this uh, uh, on a national or even regional level? Because this tells um, us working at the secretariat, uh, what should we focus our efforts on? Where can we best help? Uh, and that's the next step then, what is needed in order to get going? So how can we overcome the barriers? And then an important question that we came to after we had discussed this is how far is far enough? Because the regional sea conventions uh, don't have a mandate to go in and create OECMs. That's a national, uh, that's a national mandate, a nat national jurisdiction. So how far can we bring this discussion uh, and still provide constructive support to the countries that are doing the actual work so that we don't overstep uh, or bring it further than, than what the countries are ready to go. And out of all of this discussion um, came some concrete actions for the Baltic Sea Action Plan, which is uh, kind of the, the action plan that Telcom uses to guide all of its work. Uh, we have an action that specifically uh, deals with the spatial coverage uh, of conservation, this 30% uh, by 2030. And that now also includes uh, a link to OECMs and that OECMs could be used under this. But then there's also a very specific action uh, that says that by 2022, so this year, uh, the countries have agreed that they should come to a common understanding on what um, OECMs, uh, what the OECM criteria, uh, like how they should be viewed and how they should be used in HELCOM based on, on the definitions that were agreed by CBD uh, and within the EU. And then also define how, uh, how OECMs can support the coherence of M the MPA network. So that this is something that came up in the questions I saw as well, like looking at what is the dynamic between MPAs and OECMs? And then by 2025, uh, use all of this uh, in order to identify OECMs in the Baltic Sea region. And this then gave us the mandate. So the process so far has been, we secured the mandate as the first steps, step. Then we invited countries uh, to start nominating test cases that we could use to, to kind of trial run OECMs in the Baltic. Uh, and as part of this, we also started discussing the need for a, a regional workshop where the countries could come together and uh, discuss OECMs and bring forth their questions and concerns uh, and see that maybe those countries that have already started uh, could also provide some, some insight into how have they overcome these. Uh, so we started planning a, a workshop. Uh, and this workshop was to be uh, preceded by uh, an OECM webinar. And in this webinar, the intention was to kind of lay the groundwork, explain what are OECMs and, um, and, and kind of open the door um, for especially sector representatives that aren't familiar with OECMs from before. So we sent out an invitation for all the countries to uh, nominate possible test cases that we could run against the OECM criteria and use to as a basis for further discussion. Then uh, we started identifying potentially relevant sectors. So this goes beyond fisheries because OECMs could of course be relevant also for other sectors, but for which sectors? Uh, we prepared a questionnaire for the countries to fill in on where are they in the OECM process? Have they looked at other sectors? If they have, which sectors and how did, uh, what, what were their conclusions? And we pulled all of this together uh, and arranged the preparatory OECM webinar, which took place in uh, November last year. Once the webinar uh, was over and we had harvested questions and, uh, and like what, what the focus had been on these, uh, we adjusted the planned workshop agenda to better address the questions that the that the countries actually have and that the 
people that took part in the webinar um, highlighted. Uh, then we moved on to looking at can we find sector representatives for the different sectors that we have identified uh, and find like sector specific test cases that we can then discuss in the regional OECM workshop. Then the workshop took place early this year. Uh, following this, we made a report uh, which included both what was discussed in the workshop and the outcome and also the next steps that we propose. And now we have uh, in May this year secured the mandate to continue this work uh, and actually implement these next steps. So the workshop itself was a three day active participation online workshop uh, and it was supported by FAO and IUCN and WCPA. Uh, it kind of was an iterative process where in day one, we started out with the real basics. What are OECMs? Uh, discussions on opportunities and challenges that, that the different sector representatives recognized uh, as they could hear the presentations and so on. Then discussions on do's and don'ts. So how should one go about um, working with OECMs? And then a discussion on what is the minimum requirement for an area in the Baltic to be recognized as an OECM under HELCOM. Uh, and this, the intention with this is to lead to an initial regional understanding of the criteria for OECMs. Uh, so that this is something that all the countries could use as a basis when they really kind of get started on their OECM work. In day two, we took this minimum requirement information and we brought it into these sectoral subgroups. So we had one subgroup for each sector uh, and then they got to kind of really dig deep and try to find the, uh, like look into the criteria and see, does this work for potential OECMs in my sector? And if it doesn't, why doesn't it? And we had four main sectors represented, fisheries, shipping, energy and culture and archaeological sites. And so they looked at the criteria. They also looked at what type of potential OECMs could they see could exist under or for their sector in the Baltic. Um, different sectors might have different strengths and weaknesses with regards to OECMs. Uh, so they were also asked to, to kind of look at this and try to see that, OK, um, what's, what strengths are, uh, are there for our sector, um, so let's say for cultural and archaeological sites, they are already strictly protected, as in most cases, uh, they are very uh, restrictive of, on visitation, which is a strength. But there are also uh, some difficult bits. They are, for example, not monitored at all. Uh, so here, that's a weakness that would then need to be addressed. And then uh, how applicable is the common understanding that we came to in uh, or the draft common understanding that we produced in day one. Then day three, we came back and we looked at this common understanding uh, and, and what has come out of, of these different sectoral groups and tried to see like, okay, can we identify some general weaknesses and strengths? Can we identify where we have uh, issues or gaps in the common understanding that we need to address uh, in order for this to actually be useful? Because uh, it can't just be theoretical. You have to be able to use the criteria in real life or it won't be, um, it won't be constructive. So the results were that we, uh, or were that we uh, prepared this uh, preliminary common understanding. So it's a table that looks similar to this. So there's the criteria, then what needs to be interpreted, like what they find to be um, vague or uh, confusing. <laughs> Uh, then what has CBD, uh, the CBD guidance said about it? What has the IUCN guidance said about it? And then based on that, develop a, a kind of um, interpretation uh, for the Baltic Sea region. And then uh, we also flagged if, there, if the workshop felt like there's a need to still continue working on this or whether they think that this particular part of the criteria is very clear so that we know kind of where to go from here. The second uh, main result uh, was a um, kind of decision tree for how do you actually go about identifying an OECM? Because uh, there were a lot of questions about this. Uh, and then linking this up with the criteria 
uh, and the, the common understanding of the criteria in the Baltic. So the decision tree uh, starts by looking at identifying a measure. So you have to find a measure that could be an OECM. Then does this measure, ha measure have a spatial component? If it doesn't, it's not an OECM. Uh, if it does have a spatial component, uh, what is the spatial extent? So what is the area that is covered by the measure? Because you have to be able to identify this as, as Imen and uh, Tundi have both uh, highlighted. Uh, is this full spatial extent already covered by an MPA? If so, it's not an OECM. If the full extent is not covered by an MPA, it could be an OECM. Can the measure provide sustained long-term positive biodiversity outcomes? That's the next step here, so step six. If yes, uh, then it can move on. It's still a potential OECM. If no, it's not an OECM. Step seven is to identify the biodiversity attributes of the area. So what are the species, habitats, ecosystem services, and functions that are relevant in this area? Then identify which of the biodiversity attributes are actually positively affected by this measure. Uh, if none of them are, then it's again, not an OECM. If they are, then uh, you have to identify if any of those biodiversity attributes are negatively impacted by other activities. So activities that aren't addressed by this particular measure in the same area. And then identify if those negative impacts are significant enough to affect the biological diversity or ecosystem function of the area or uh, its immediate surroundings. And here it gets a little more complex because here you can go both ways. So if yes, you have to see if those activities can also be addressed through measures. If they can, then you could have a potential, potential multi-governance OACM where you have uh, measures under several different governance structures. If it's not, then it's not an OACM. If there's no need uh, for more uh, measures, as in there are no significant impacts, negative impacts, then you have a potential uh, single sector governance OECM. Now, I want to highlight that this is only very kind of preliminary, this decision structure, and it's only planned uh, for the Baltic Sea, uh, where, where we don't have some of the additional um, kind of additional governance and, and management structures, which are very common in other parts of the world. Uh, so we have in most countries very centralized governance. So this is probably not as useful uh, in other parts of the world, but this is kind of the, the first step in the process for the Baltic. Overall, the results that you can't put on paper <laughs> was that we raised the profile of OECMs across the region, both through the process leading up to the workshop and the workshop itself. We saw a significant increase in interest and understanding of OECMs across relevant sectors that don't normally work with conservation. Uh, we got to start the development of this shared vision of OECMs across all the countries around the Baltic Sea. Uh, also a shared understanding of the criteria so that when the countries now start implementing, they have something to base their implementation on that, that they can go back and discuss with other countries in the same region. And then uh, start the development of a common approach for identifying OECMs, because there was in this workshop, just like I saw in many of the questions here, a lot of uh, open uh, open questions about how one goes about identifying OECMs. So overall, we learned that there is a clear interest in discussing OECMs and a need for doing this across countries, uh, even if they are at different stages in the OECM process. Uh, it's also important to do have this discussion across and within sectors uh, so that everyone that have the potential to be involved in the OECM process are brought in quite early, uh, and also that the sector representatives get to talk to each other, irrespective of what country they come from. There is a significant added value in having a common framework and really actionable results coming out of a workshop, so something concrete that you can take forward, um, so that the process doesn't stop at the end of, of uh, the workshop itself. 
it's really valuable to start early before the countries uh, have gone far in their OECM process, because once uh, in independent approaches have been established, it's difficult to kind of bring them all together again. And then that it's uh, very useful uh, for something like OECMs where there are so many questions and we don't have all the answers to take a collaborative uh, approach to these discussions and, and working up these uh, kind of shared approaches um, and to jump between this kind of general and targeted uh, approach when collecting the input uh, because this gives you results that, that are more actionable uh, and also allows you to take in, into account views that might otherwise have been overlooked. But we have some main challenges, oops, sorry, some main challenges also for the future. They are similar to what has been discussed here as well. Well, first of all, there are some remaining terminology that needs to be discussed and agreed on at a regional level. But we also need to have a better understanding of the links between a human pressure, so something that we do that causes pressure on the environment and a change in status of the environment. So how do our actions affect biodiversity? We also need to have a better understanding between the link of a measure and an actual change in status. So if we're putting a measure in place, if we see a result, is it actually related to the measure or not? And I think Tundi also has uh, explained this really well. Uh, there's always uh, an issue of access to data and information. In order to be able to answer these questions, we need quite a lot of data uh, and we need to have quite a lot of information on what measures are, are there and how are they being implemented and so on. There's quite a lot of subjective elements to the assessment, which is fine when you're doing it uh, nationally, but when you then try to bring all of this information together at the regional level across nine different countries, it, its uh, high levels of subjectivity makes the uh, analysis of the result much more difficult. Uh, there are resource requirements that come with OECMs that the countries uh, haven't necessarily secured yet. And the, the approach to management and management structures in the different countries can vary a lot. Uh, and this could be hard or could be difficult to, to kind of account for when you look at it um, or OECMs from a regional level. Uh, and so this is something that we still need to work more on. And the next steps is that now uh, the decision tree and the common understanding uh, is going to be discussed at the working group level, which one I showed you there on one of the earlier slides. Uh, and and um, any changes or, um, or proposals will be considered uh, then the Secretariat uh, will also draft some regional guidance on the process of recognizing OECMs. And here we will, of course, use the experiences that other countries and other, other regions have had uh, that are further along in this process. Once this has been done uh, and we have a common understanding uh, and regional guidance, then this will be approved at the political level. Uh, and this is inten the intention is for this to happen in December this year. Uh, and then uh, still further for uh, adoption uh, at the commission level. And once this has been adopted, all of this will be published and made available uh, through the Helcom library and, and website for the countries to use, but also for, for other regions across the world who are interested in doing something similar. And that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you, Janneke. Um, and thank you so much to all three speakers. These have been fa fantastic presentations. And thank you to everyone who is participating. Um, there's just been a really tremendous um, response from the community answering questions and thinking through this. Um, we have four questions lined up that we'd really like to get through. Um, and then our, our presenters will be answering other questions that we weren't able to get to during this, um, this webinar later uh, via email. Um, so let's go on through those. So one is, would speakers agree that the text about OECM following 
and this is in quotes, with associated ecosystem function values is redundant because everywhere that is considered important for some aspect of biodiversity must have some ecosystem function, service, and value, depending on perspectives. Thus, the real criteria are the first three, defined area, not an MPA, governed and managed, and then he also added, I, he, he admitted, omitted effective. I, I, I can start the ball rolling on that one, Sarah, um, and, and it's a good question. I think it, it could be, although the areas of importance for biodiversity are often not necessarily those that are of importance for ecosystem services, and, and yes, areas of biodiversity have ecosystem services associated with them, but I think many of the OECMs would have an a, a, um, a primary focus on some ecosystem services. And then when you go into the details of what it is to be effective is that managing for that ecosystem services does not negatively impact the biodiversity as well. Um, so we can go into details um, by email. I believe Mark has, has asked that question and, and it, it, it makes for an interesting debate, Mark, but I think there is a, uh, a reason for that, particularly when we realize this is the CBD negotiating. So there are a lot of political messages around um, many of these. And then we, those that are in the interface between science and policy have to grapple with, um, but there is a political message behind that. And that is, you know, we could have areas for um, ecosystem services as well. And, and so we can talk more about that. Okay, thank you, Amen. Um, another question from Anne, perhaps a fundamental area of discussion is what constitutes complementary in the statement, OECMs are complementary to MPAs. So how and what ways are they alike enough to be complementary? Cindy, do you want to take that? Or I, I'm, I'm not sure if I want to take them all. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yeah, well, the question of complementarity. So um, I think the best way to think about it is not on a site by site basis, but to think about how the area contributes to the, a wider system of MPAs or network if, it, if that is um, in place. And by network, I mean something which is designed with connectivity in mind. So the complement, the complementing is where um, uh, an area that has, for whatever reason, not been declared as an MPA. It could be, as Iman said, that it, it actually acts like an MPA, but um, it's administered privately and therefore is not reported as a national in the national um, system of MPAs. Um, or uh, the legislation hasn't gone through to make it an MPA for whatever reason. Um, if it's contributing to some uh, protection of biodiversity and um, by doing that is strengthening the resilience and, and coverage of a network of protected sites. Um, in that way, it complements MPAs. Um, it also complements MPAs. There was a question in the chat about, could you envision um, OECMs on the periphery of MPAs? And that's a hugely exciting idea, um, and one that's being discussed a lot in people who are evaluating MPAs and seeing how sometimes the spillover effects, for instance, of closed MPAs, closed areas, um, are not being kind of realized to the wider ecosystem because there's fishing on the line and therefore, um, those those benefits are essentially evaporating, and could we set up these buffer areas around the MPAs, which are not legally reported as MP as part of the MPA, but actually act to complement enhance the MPA protection? I think is a, another hugely important um, possibility and uh, one that should be explored. Okay. Thank you very much for that response. Um, we're gonna group three questions now um, about reporting. Uh, the first one is OECMs are listed in the database. Where can anybody find out how they qualified to be an OECM? And a second one that came in, given the case-by-case -case basis of OECMs designation per country agency, 
Will OECM reporting be independently checked or verified to ensure consistency among, among countries and ensure criteria are being correctly applied? And then a third reporting question. Um, some biosphere reserves are being proposed as OECM in the database. One must assume these had no national legal status. So I'll, I'll take the reporting questions. Um, I think the, the details of that are in the link in the WGPA manual, and you can go into that. But generally, the, uh, w, WCMC is going to distinguish two data provider, whether it's a state provided um, data and whether the, it's, it's the state that has um, submitted the OECM, in which case it is considered as state verified. Um, if it's another stakeholder that is uh, submitting the OECM, then it goes through a verification. Um, the, the, where you find that information depends very much on um, whether the state or other stakeholders have uh, put a link to where how the area qualifies as OECMs and to the link of the assessment. Many of these currently don't, and it's not a hard requirement. Um, and again, because if it is state, it's the same for MPAs. You know, you're not going to question a state if it says this is an MPA and I've declared it as an MPA. The same if it recognizes it as an OECM, um, it, it is state verified. The question, the question of biosphere reserve is important because currently biosphere reserve are not accounted within the WGPA unless they coincide with the national legislation. And in any case, it's only the core zone of the biosphere reserved. If it coincides with a, with a protected area, then it gets accounted. So the buffer zone and the development zone, in many of these, we have important conservation measures. And, and I think for many of these could qualify as OECMs, certainly as potential OECMs, um, that's a, a, an opportunity. So this goes also along with the previous comment by Tundi that, that there is, these are the opportunities of how MPAs and OECMs could be complementary. Okay, thank you, Iman. Um, and we'll have one last question. And that is, um, how are we expecting developing countries to meet these criteria and be able to mimic a process such as the one described for the Baltic Sea? Sorry, could you uh, repeat the question? I'm answering questions sure. in the chat at the same time. <laughs> sure, yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, it's a lot to do. Um, how are we expecting developing countries to meet these criteria and be able to mimic a process such as the one described for the Baltic Sea? Uh, well, I think it depends on the scale a little bit also. I, at the uh, Idhelkom and for the Baltic Sea, it was done at a very large scale as in uh, all the countries joined together. But this a similar exercise could be done only nationally or even with just a relevant authority within a country uh, to, to try to come to like a national position uh, shared amongst authorities on how to do this. So uh, even though in the Baltic it was done on a large scale, uh, the same kind of framework or idea could be done uh, at much smaller scale, which might be easier to handle. Um, and also uh, kind of more implementable uh, in other regions of the world. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Janneke. Did, uh, I would add to that if you add. Mind, Sarah, because I think, you know, sometimes the process can seem overwhelming. And, and when you kind of hear about it and see complicated things and, you know, decision trees and questions and data and, and so on. But I think once you get into the assessment, you don't necessarily need to have tons of data. Expert advice is also useful. And some of the expert assessments are used for other processes. You know, the green list, Sue has been mentioning the green list. That is an expert assessment. Some of it has data. Some of it is actually an expert opinion. The red list is done on base on expert opinion. So I think a lot of this is, is really through the dialogue and coming to an agreement to these common thresholds, as, as Yannick has said. Having it at national level is important. Having it at regional level is also important. And the example of Helcom is fantastic. Uh, 
it's it's that first dialogue was was really good. The Mediterranean beyond the fishery. I mean, the fisheries within the Mediterranean is doing that. Then the Barcelona Convention is looking at fisheries, yes, but other things and complementarity in, in in interactions with other sector. You protect an area from fishing, but then it's open to oil and gas. And this is where the role of the regional seas and that marine spatial planning and how can we be complementary in conserving biodiversity values at the end of the day is is great um so i i, I think don't don't get stopped by a process that may seem overwhelmed um but once you get into the details of it you know you work it out as you go okay um, thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of our speakers, Iman, Tundi, Yannicka. This was a fantastic presentations and question answering. And thank you to everyone who attended for also <laughs> fantastic questions and question answering and sharing. Um, it's it's going to be exciting to see how OECMs progress in the coming years. And um, I, we look forward to learning more and, and having future webinars on this. So thank you all for being here today. And uh, we'll be sending some follow-up information to everyone um, after the webinar with some resources that were shared. Okay. Thanks. Hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.